You're listening to the Southampton Delivery Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the Southampton Football Club and all of the SFC fans. If you want to have guarantees, you have to buy a washing machine. Either we win or we learn, and today we learn. Adacha, Austin, shot at his It's in field to Mane, 25 yards out. Lovely ball for Pella. Onside, 1-0. Blue fast shot. Oh, my word. He ran around a bit, but Bambi on ice. It would be very, very embarrassing to watch. And now, your host, Matt Markstone. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Southampton Delivery Podcast, a podcast and newsletter dedicated to the Southampton Football Club and all of the SFC fans, and available right here on SouthamptonDelivery.com. My name is Matt Markson. I am the host of the show, and no matter where you are, no matter how you may be listening, whether this is your first time or you've been here before, thanks for making the show part of your day. I hope that you enjoy it, and I hope that by now, the Sunday blues have gone, you're into your week. Uh, hopefully it's going better than, uh, you know, most of the match that happened on Sunday afternoon. Hopefully you're in a better mood uh, than you will hear me be uh, on the show with Tom this week. And hopefully we don't bring you down. Uh, and I don't think we will because I'm joined this week by Tom Murray, who is part of the team that provides audio description commentary uh, for the blind and visually impaired fans at St. Mary's. And he does that uh, in association with Alan March Sport, who uh, have expanded to uh, kind of uh, do a number of stadiums throughout the uh, throughout England, and so um, you know we talk about that, and that's positive, and that's that's great. And Tom brings his perspective uh, from the game he commentated on yesterday's, or sorry, on on Sunday's match. And you know, overall, not that bad of a conversation, I don't think. I think I am the one who is uh, slightly more negative than 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 Tom. And so, thanks to Tom for kind of uh, keeping the show afloat. Uh, I do appreciate that. If you are interested in any of the audio description commentary that Tom does, you can follow him on Twitter at T214Murray. Uh, you can also follow uh, Saints underscore AD. Uh, that is the audio description commentary handle uh, where they tweet information about away stuff and home stuff. And uh, that way, if you or someone you know uh, needs access to uh, or requires access to the service, uh, you can get that stuff. And all the links, as always, are in the show notes. Uh, Tom also does a podcast. It's called the Under the Lights Podcast. Uh, the handle is at under underscore saints uh, links once again in the show notes, but uh, always a pleasure to talk to Tom. Uh, he is one of the patrons of the show and uh, it's always just great to be able to sit and, and talk with him about, about his perspective, uh, about his show, about uh, his work. Uh, and that is really what this is all about. So uh, hopefully there's not too much of the blues, uh, even though, you know, we didn't look good on Sunday, but anyway, uh, on to the international break and on to my conversation with Tom, I uh, hope you enjoy it. And once again, thanks for listening. We'd like to welcome back to the Southampton Delivery Podcast, Tom Murray. You can find him on Twitter at T214Murray. You can find his podcast, the Under the Lights Podcast, at under underscore saints. Uh, the link is in the show notes if you do not already follow them. Um, Tom, you do some work with uh, Alan March Sport for audio description commentary for people who are maybe new. There are some new listeners to the show that maybe haven't heard from you before, but um, y- you do that, and we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the, the disappointing loss to Chelsea, which was just now um, a couple of hours ago, and then, uh, I don't know, I guess we'll kick around some team news and, and, and all of that. But uh, first and foremost, welcome back, and, and how are you? Thank you very much for having me back. It's always a pleasure to come on. I'm good. I'm very well at the moment. It's been very busy on the footballing front. Um, yeah, lot, lots of, lot has been going on. It's the second season of the audio description service at Southampton at St. Mary's. Um, it's good that there's been an increase in the number of teams over the summer that now do the audio description, the likes of Cardiff in the Championship and Wolves in the Premier League, which will be very useful for any fans who want to go to that away game and want to listen to an audio description service provided by Alan Mark Sport. But yeah, it's been very busy. We've also had the England friendly in September, I was lucky enough to do that. So, uh, yeah, all busy on the home front, as it were. Right, right. And so you don't have to work the away games. You just work the ones at St. Mary's. Um, but people can get the same level of service or same type of service at Wolves if they go away. So that's that's good. And, and it's also nice to see that it's expanding for people who, uh, so everybody can kind of enjoy the football. But 
Um, just very briefly, because I think most of the listeners are, are probably the same, but for anybody who's new, just very briefly, what is the audio description commentary that, that you do, uh, just so people have a, a, an understanding? So the audio description commentary that we do is for blind and visually impaired fans at um, Southampton matches. This is for both home and away supporters. And what we do, we're a team of four, myself, Callum, Nick, and Andy. We describe the game in a lot of detail. We make sure that people listening know exactly where the ball is, who's passed it, and in what direction it's going, just so that they can feel um, that they're getting this mo- the same out of a football match as people who are lucky enough to have the gift of sight. And, uh, yeah, we just want to bring the game to life for those who are not fortunate enough to be able to see it. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, you mentioned you were able to do the, the England uh, friendly, which obviously uh, St. Mary's hosted uh, against Kosovo. And I mean, I realize the Premier League is a, uh, I think we talked about it in a previous episode, uh, the, the, the names you have to describe sometimes are, um, you know, interesting and, and from everywhere. But, you know, were any of those, any of those names that particularly challenging or were, uh, or were you kind of equipped for it given given the number of teams that have visited St. Mary's over, over the past year and, and a couple of months? I think it, in, it was difficult in terms of this is a whole 11 of new players that you need to um, that you need to get to grips with. Some names I recognized, um, but unfortunately, their, their best player, in, uh, in my opinion, uh, Milot Rashika, he used to play for, I think he might still do, um, for Chelsea. So he was some. He was a name that I'd come across before, but a lot of them were unfamiliar to me. And in terms of pronunciation, they're not the worst in the world. There are, there's definitely some worse, but um, just making sure that you could. It was difficult just to make sure that you could get the uh, the names to the players as the ball was going around the pitch. Thankfully, England had a lot of the ball, so <laughs> Kos- Kosovo Kosovo didn't have huge periods of possession, so um, it wasn't too bad but they gave England a really really good game it's actually I'd consider the best game I've commentated on I mean England winning 5-3 5-1 by half time the atmosphere was very different to um, a Premier League game at St Mary's and that's not a uh, that's not a slight against the Southampton fans it was just a completely different atmosphere it was really I don't, it's, it's difficult to describe it. And I know as an audio description commentator, that's something that <laughs> should be a bit of a bit of a challenge for myself and not something I shouldn't say, but it, it was, it just felt completely different. There was um, a different vibe to the game. We actually had pockets of uh, Kosovo fans in the home end. And the, I think in total, there was about 20,000 of them in Southampton. They made a great, a great amount of noise and they didn't care either. Um, they stood out completely. I mean, they seem to be, oblivious to the fact that they were surrounded by England fans. So when Kosovo scored, they, in the middle of England fans, would just jump up and celebrate. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was actually one thing that was quite funny. Uh, We were Dave Rogers, who works for Animal Sport. I was doing the game with him. And just as we were about to go on air, um, because we do a pre-match show probably about 40 minutes, 45 minutes, depending on the time of kickoff, before, before the match and just go through the teams, have a chat about the game, what we think. And we're about to go on air and we're about to say good evening and welcome to um, St. Mary's. And a Kosovo fan directly in front of us stood up with a Vuvuzela and blasted it as loud as he could. Oh, no. And I know we just thought, should we start again? But, uh, yeah, thankfully, um, the steward found it quite quickly and, uh, I mean, took it, took it away. I, I, I don't mind any... I think it adds to the atmosphere, but the World Cup in South Africa, when there are boo sailors all over the place, you just hear this all the time, yeah. is uh, quite frustrating. It was almost just a constant. I mean, that, that World Cup was almost just a constant kind of hum underneath the the, the commentary. And as somebody who works uh, with audio quite a bit, um, I can take the, I can take the constant. I can, I can cut that out usually. Um, but to have it just kind of pop up out of nowhere when you're trying to start, it can be unnerving. And I'm not sure I could, I'm not sure I could deal with it if it was happening in my ear the whole time. Um, so I know, and I'm sure the people um, using the audio description commentary were happy that that was not going on during the entire game, because that would have been, uh, I think distracting to say the least. Um, but anyway, uh, I'm, I'm very glad you guys got to, got to do that. It's a kind of, I mean, I'm sure it's an honor and I'm sure it's also a, a pretty cool experience to see, you know, the England team that, you know, that's supposed to be the, the best players of, for, for the country out there and, and representing and, 
obviously it's not. I mean, was it a friendly or was it a world? It's a world cup qualifier, correct? It was no, it's um, it was a Euro twenty twenty qualifier. Oh, okay. okay. Um, Sorry. Because because that no 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 the, um, that 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 begins uh, next summer. Right. Right. Um, but it was yeah, it it was a fantastic game. I mean, Kosovo. You'd think coming into the match that whilst they had a decent record, you'd think that this would be a side that England could easily beat, mm-hmm. but. They took the lead after 30 seconds, and I got to describe that goal, and I was almost in a state of shock as I was doing it. I was just thinking, wow, this is not what anyone was expecting. And I was kind of pleased with them at the same time because I thought that was the best thing that could have happened to the game. Um, It could have easily been... Um, a 4-0 England win and as I know no no win for the team you support is boring but an England 4-0 win for a dull game where they passed it about a bit and scored every 20 minutes or so but for them to take the lead immediately it was it was a case of okay England have actually got to play to get something out of this game and although England went 5-1 up uh, by half time Kosovo scored twice in the second half and could have got more so it was a really entertaining match yeah I thought I I I remember watching it and I remember kind of being really being, like you said, shocked that uh, Kosovo scored to, to open it. But uh, overall, obviously, I got the job done. I was um, just going through a list of tournaments that the U.S. won't qualify for. Um, I think that's why I was thinking about the, uh, the World Cup, uh, not the Euros. But um, anyway, it'll be it'll be good. And, and England obviously should qualify for that without much, much fuss. Um, but. If people want to follow that, uh, the link is in the show notes so they can get to the stuff at Southampton. Um, and I'm sure it will be kind of much the same process at, at Wolves. Um, and, and so if people need that, that, that service uh, or want that service, they can, they can get that. And I think it's, uh, I think it's pretty great. So hopefully it uh, continues to, to grow. And you guys will be back at the next home game. Uh, but, of course, we have to go away and we have to wait after the international break and all that stuff. But we host uh, Leicester City uh, towards the end of the month. Um, before we go away to Man City twice in a week. So that'll be super awesome, uh, given the way things are going, I think. Um, you do another thing, though. You do a podcast called uh, Under the Lights. Um, that is at under, and then an underscore, and the word saints. Um, you want to just fill people in on, on, on what's going on with that, and, and who does that with you, and, and maybe a little bit about what you guys cover? Yeah, I'll go on to that in just a second. Um, just quickly going back to the, wolf, yeah. the Wolves thing, I will put out a tweet relatively soon about that service just so that people who follow me and follow the Saints AD service are aware of it as well but going uh, heading back to the um to the podcast Callum and I it was um uh, an idea of Callum over the summer which I latched on to um to just have a I mean we're two Saints fans we are two members of the team that do the audio description at Southampton and Fan of March Sport and we uh yeah, we thought, why not actually have a podcast of just trying to expand that? Um, we did try to do a match day vlog for the Manchester United game. Um, we hopefully will bring that out relatively soon, but we're just taking a few technical issues with that. But we've got some good content that I think people will be interested in seeing. Uh, we sometimes do a, a post-match video as well that we put on YouTube just to give our thoughts immediately after the game has happened. And... I thought as two Saints fans, why not um, chat about the team that we love? There are a lot of podcasts out there. Um, and, you know, we just thought, why, why not expand a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, as somebody who does one, it's, it is my, it's the way I stay in touch with the team. It's the excuse to do it. It's when we play like we did today, it's, it kind of forces me to look and try to find something, try to look a little bit deeper or find something that, you know, that we can grab a hold of and kind of dig into or whatever. And whether that's good or bad or healthy or unhealthy for me to do, it, it is what I enjoy doing. And I, I mean, I enjoy talking to to people like you and having met you and, you know, gotten to know you over, over a couple of, um, you know, hours sitting here recording and, um, and then getting to hear you guys' show and all that stuff. I think it's, I think it's great. So um, what I really don't like is when people, we have certain people online who I think are just loud and I don't think there's very many of them necessarily, but, um, you know, they abuse people who try new things or who do videos or vlogs or podcasts or whatever. And really, um, I just try to ignore those people as much as I can, but it's easy to ignore them from the other side of the world. I don't have to, you know, potentially see these people walking around town or anything like that. So it's, it's a bit different for me, I think, but, um, I'm glad you guys are doing it and I, I hope you guys are enjoying the the whole process cause it's a, there's a learning curve involved. Um, but it sounds like you guys are 
you guys are doing all right. Yeah, we're really enjoying doing it. And um, we haven't put, made an episode for a little while at the moment, just things um, outside of our control. Uh, just to stop, um, prevent us from making these episodes. But we uh, hopefully will come together and make another one quite soon. There's certainly, with the gap in between the episodes, there's certainly a lot to discuss in that time. So hopefully the next one will be a, a good big roundup with lots of uh, healthy discussion about Saints. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, well, we have, we have a couple of things to uh, talk about for today because uh, you were obviously uh, at, at the match at St. Mary's commentating on the game. Um, and it, it, it didn't go well, but let's, let's start at the beginning. We'll see if we can, if we can pull some positives out of this and then we'll answer some questions and, you know, we'll get on with our day. I, I understand you, you're probably exhausted after having, you know, uh, what, what time did you arrive at the match today for a 2 PM kickoff? So a little bit earlier than normal, but what time did you have to arrive? And, and then what time did you get and finally roll back home? Well, I left home about nine o'clock in the morning just to get the train into Southampton, and I arrived at St. Mary's at about um, about eleven o'clock this morning. Um, and then in the three hours between that and kickoff, just going through the notes, just enjoying some food that Southampton had put out for us, and then we go on air about forty-five, forty minutes before before kickoff, just to chat about the match like we normally do, and then. Obviously, the game happened, and I'd say I'd get home about, I think I got home about half past five in the end. So a long, a long day, almost like a full work day. But yeah. uh, result aside, I always enjoy doing it. So, it, I mean, for the two hours of doing the game, no matter what the result is, I really enjoy the whole day. Um, sometimes the result spoils the journey home. But, again, uh, it's, it, it's a privilege to be able to do it. Right. And to help fans who who can't see the game uh, to enjoy it, so I, I I don't mind the result. I really enjoy, just enjoy doing it, and I know that I will commentate on a win eventually. So <laughs> that, that gets me through it. Yeah, yeah, we we can only hope, right? Um, all right. Well, well, let's start with with the lineup. I mean, there were a couple of uh, injury issues. Obviously, Cedric's still out. Uh, Genevo's still out, and I know there was, there was a lot of focus on Ralph and and his team selection and what it was going to be. Given that we haven't seemed settled, there's a, there's been a couple of odd choices uh, in in the in the team, in the team selection over the past couple of weeks, and you know I I know that we all I think I think all, almost every Saints fan still trusts Ralph you know as much as we possibly can trust a, a manager of, of the club, and yet he has done some things that I think had it been somebody else, had it been Hughes or Pellegrino or or Puel that they would have, I think he would have come under much more criticism for making the same choices. And, but I also think, and I think this is something that maybe, although you and I haven't talked about it, we've talked about it on the show before, is I think that you, you earn that. You earn that with, with kind of how your press conferences go, um, the, the way they, that we see him interact in those short uh, videos that the club put out during the week. Um, and, and all of these things kind of leading up to the game time decisions, th- those build some sort of trust and, and rapport with the fans. And so when he decides to make a decision, oftentimes I am quick to just say, well, you know, that's the decision that he must feel that's best. Like, let's let's go with it and believe it. But over the past couple of weeks, it hasn't worked out. Um, and I, I'd be interested to just kind of get your thoughts on on what it's been like over the past couple of weeks, having, you know, seen the club, uh, seen the team selections and, and kind of had to try to explain that to some of the people who are who are watching the game when you're when Danzo goes from left back to right back. And, you know, we we lose a right back and then we wind up deciding that we're going to uh, fill that with a, an extra center back instead. And so I, I mean, what, what are your, what, are you, what have your, been your thoughts over the past couple of weeks on kind of Ralph's selections and things like that? I think the, the Bournemouth game was really quite disappointing because as you said, there are a lot of players out of position. You had Cedric, a right back playing at left back and Danzo, a center back playing at right back where you thought, if you're going to do that, surely you put down to a left back where he might have been, where he's played earlier on in the season. Some of the, again, we don't see what goes on in training, and Ralph does. I think last season he certainly earned a lot of um, respect, and he earned those brownie brownie points, as it were, last season by transforming us from a side that looked like it had no plan to a side that actually had a bit of an identity. I think this season it's been really tough because. Whilst he's made some uh, positional errors, in my in my opinion, I think 
fans need to also look at the fixture list that we've had. And it's not been easy. It's been one of the tougher starts. And I'm not saying that to be biased towards Saints, but in those fixtures, I mean, ignoring the fact that we played Liverpool, Chelsea, Manchester United, and I know Manchester United are pretty awful at the moment, but they're still Manchester United. And, um, but then you mix that in with the fact that we played Burnley away. That's no, that's no easy game for anyone. Brighton away, Sheffield United away. Those are two difficult games. We've won them both. So we have got some decent wins in there. But in the first eight games, no game is easy in the Premier League. But you haven't seen a game that's a nailed on three points for Saints, no matter what form they may have been in um, beforehand, even if they went into the season in really good form, having finished last year strongly, if they had to do that, there's still, there's still no game out of the first eight, which you'd look at and think, OK, we're, it's pretty nailed on that we're going to get the points this year. I think that Ralph has also bought himself a lot of brownie points with the fact that he um, was in charge of the Mullering of Portsmouth a week and a half ago. And he's earned a lot of respect and a lot of joy from the fans because that was a fantastic night down at Fratton Park. And I dare say it may, I, I would like, it would be interesting to see how people would react to him if that game had not been against Portsmouth and had been in fact against another side towards the bottom of League One. Because let's face it, taking away from the fact that we play Pompey and yes, it is a derby, that was a win against the side two, three divisions below us and a 4-0 between um, a Premier League side on that level is to be expected. The games don't get any easier. Wolves away, Leicester at home, which is going to be another really tricky game because Leicester are flying really high and I thought they were unlucky not to get anything from the Liverpool match last um, last night. And then you've got, again, Wolves before that. They, they I don't think they've got many points this year, but they've just won 2-0 at Manchester City. And so... You know, it, it doesn't get any easier. And the fact is, I don't think we play our first... It, again, no no game in the Premier League is easy, but the first winnable home match is, is Norwich, really, or Watford, and they're towards the end of November and December. So I think Ralph needs to be cut a bit of slack in terms of he has had a very difficult start. Um, some of the decisions have been disappointing. I thought the performance against Bournemouth was disappointing. I thought the game... Today, Chelsea are a very, very good side, but I thought we could have approached it a little bit better. So I'd say at the moment I'm not too concerned just because of the strength of the teams that we've come up against. But um, I, I'm a little disappointed that we didn't do a little bit better. Yeah, yeah. I, I think in the end it's it's a very disappointing just performance. And even, you know, I mean, not every match. I think we, I, I think I'm, I'm guilty of this. I'll, I'll just say me. I won't say we. Um, I think I'm guilty of of giving the team a, a a sort of free hit against the against the bigger clubs and say you know as long as we play well and put in a performance then you know I'll be happy with that because that shows that we're improving but we haven't done that even consistently over the past couple of seasons and and it's it's kind of getting to the point now where you know you need to to do the performance and get a result you know or just get a result because even in some of the matches that we've won it's been ugly it hasn't been you know smooth sailing we haven't dominated teams we haven't you know, necessarily press them into oblivion and just caused massive amounts of mistakes. It's been kind of individual errors sometimes that have undone teams uh, or individual brilliance on our part that has gotten us a goal. Um, and we're still kind of waiting for the offensive stuff, I think, to click because as soon as uh, as soon as you give us the ball and let us attack, we are basically wide open for a counterattack and we probably aren't going to score um, if you if you are at all organized defensively. So it's been it's been frustrating, but let's let's get to uh, and go through the lineup just very quickly because, like as as we talked about, um, the selections have been kind of questionable, I guess, and I think that's that's a fair criticism. Um, not to say that that Ralph doesn't see see things a certain way, or or he or he's not correct in how he's lining the team up, even. Uh, but but it definitely has caused some question, and uh, so he starts today with Angus Gunn in goal. Uh, Jan Valery comes in; he hasn't played. Uh, recently, he was on the bench last week. Uh, Jan Bednarek, Maya Yoshida uh, as the center backs, Ryan Bertrand at left back. Um, and then the three midfielders, Hoiberg, Romeo, Ward Prowse, have been kind of there all the time, all season. Redmond, Long, and Ings up front. And I think Long was the one that people looked at and went, like, you know, why is he coming into the team now? Um, 
obviously Adams was out of the team last week. Now he's on the bench. Uh, and, and people are questioning that. Uh, Vestergaard completely gone from the squad in the stands. Uh, and the bench looks like McCarthy, Stevens, Danzo. Uh, so two center backs there. Um, Armstrong, Buffal, Obafemi, and Adams. And so, I mean, that's, you can kind of tell which, you know, there aren't, there aren't that many options coming off of the bench, but maybe Harsh and Buffal um, to, to, to have to go to the bench. And, and Adams, obviously, uh, you know, just needs, he needs to find a goal somehow. And maybe starting him from the, from the, from the off with the way that Ings has been playing, maybe Ings needs to be the guy that, that starts there. So, um, I mean, what did you make of the lineup initially? And, and were there any, was there any, anything that worried you at all about, about how we were uh, potentially going to line up? I was actually really pleased when I saw the lineup. I thought it was a really good, good team. And whilst Callum and I did discuss the inclusion of Shane Long, we thought that actually it would be the Saints' benefit because Chelsea were there to be got at in defence. And certainly in the first half, they were making a few errors. And Shane Long is the perfect player to have um, against the side that are not so sure in defence. You want someone who's going to run very quickly and directly at you um, and to get the ball. And he had quite a bit of luck. I mean, there was one situation in the first half where a hopeful ball was played down the left side and he was up against two Chelsea defenders and you thought okay Chelsea have dealt with this and Saints ended up getting their first corner of the game from it and mm. I think that's what he what he could bring I was I, I had no problems with the uh, with the starting uh, with the starting 11 I thought dropping Shays obviously confidence is very low after such a positive pre-season and getting goals within about 30 seconds of matches starting. He's now struggling to even buy a goal at the moment. And I think it was, I thought it was good from Ralph to have him on the bench because one thing that could really boost you as a striker is if he were able to come off the bench and maybe make a good contribution and get a goal from there because he, with his strength and his energy, would be up against the tiring back line. Sadly for him, Chelsea had won the game by then, so he couldn't make too much of an impact. But I thought he still did something. He got in behind a couple of times, and I think his just lack of confidence stopped him from getting a, uh, getting a, a shot away at goal. But again, I, had, I really had no problems with the team. I thought it was a good way to set up. I mean, yeah, Long brings you the, the ability to both play on the counter attack if Chelsea are dominant in possession and uh, and and attacking, uh, given just the raw pace, and also he his work rate in the pressing system is is great, and he's played out wide um, under Kuman. He didn't always play as a central striker for him, um, mostly because we had a beautiful man by the name of Graziano Pella playing most of the time. Well, um, but you know, long was in that team quite often and people were critical of him, but I think there was one year in there where I think he scored, I want to say he scored 10 goals. I think I could be wrong. It might, might not be quite 10, but he, he's, there was one season in there where he scored uh, a lot. And, and I think it was, I, I think it shows that he is, he is maybe more capable than we give him credit for. Um, although he's been what seems to be a, a several season long, uh, bad run of, of form in front of goal, but um, to have him in there, you know, it's always a little bit, like I, I, I wish it was somebody else sometimes, but when you think about the game plan or think about uh, what, what he brings to the team, as you said, uh, it, it, I think it's not necessarily that, that bad of a, of a choice. Um, and, and having Redmond out wide and maybe allowing him a bit more freedom to kind of drift. Um, I know uh, the TV coverage here had him lined up, uh, had us lined up as a four, two, two, two. And that's not what it was. It was a four, three, three, I think pretty clearly once the game got going, um, and, and the game started well, I thought, I thought the first 10 minutes or so we were, we were into it and we were pressing and we, you know, Chelsea, as you mentioned, were, were not flawless at the back. Um, Tamori was, was trying to play us through several times and, and leaving the balls for us to, to get to and causing problems. So, um, far from, uh, flawless from them, but, uh, we just, once again, weren't able to, to really test Kev. I think we had two shots early on, but they were both off target. Uh, and it took us a while to even uh, come up with a with a shot that would force the keeper to work at all. Yeah, I thought the first um, 10 minutes we started really brightly. Redmond had that shot from range, which, you know, was almost like the goal against Portsmouth where he just cut inside, went in quite central, and then tried to hit it on a, into one of the corners. He At that point, we were getting um, we were getting corners as well. There was one corner that, I was re- that really perplexed me when we just hit it really low across the edge of the box and there was absolutely no one there. Right. I think I did think that we started 
I, I thought we started quite brightly, and I think we would have done and continue to build in the half. Um, but that Chelsea goal sort of came out of nothing, really, and our head sort of dropped, because from where we were sat, in our view, I thought Yoshida had actually got it off the line, but it, obviously he didn't. But it was a case of, um, I thought Saints had it under control to a point up until up until that goal. Yeah, I mean, that, that goal kind of came out of nowhere, and it wasn't... It's. It's just another. It's another example of a mistake and, and a lack of communication between, um, between Gunn and Bednarak, I think, uh, or Gunn and Yoshida, uh, Gunn and the center backs. I guess we'll just go w- with that. But it was another. It was also another example of just how, when we're pressing, the simple ball over the top cuts out the the pressing of the midfielders. It cuts out the pressing of the forwards, and it catches Valerie. And uh, out of position, or the other center back, or the other sorry, the other fullback out of position, and and forces our center backs to turn and run towards our own goal. And you know there has to be something better there. We saw it happen uh, late on against Bournemouth, and it's just it's too easy for teams to do that. And and Abraham, I'm I'm going to be critical of him as well because I'm not sure he meant to shoot there. I think he was trying to flick it over gun and get it under control again and shoot. Um, he hit it too hard and it wound up in the goal. Uh, uh, more fair play to him and fair play to Yoshida for putting in the effort to try to get back and clear it. Um, and I saw on the TV in the live coverage, it looked like as soon as he goes to clear it, it almost you can just go, you just know that that's going to be a goal. Like it had, it had to have crossed the line, but I have no idea how Yoshida actually managed to get it out of the goal without touching the crossbar or anything else. So, um, but at that point, we were 100% ahead of them and beating them to balls and everything else. It was just kind of out of nothing. All of a sudden they're now they're they're one nil up and kind of the whole tempo and vibe of the game changes. Exactly. I thought the game completely changed from there. And then suddenly they were finding pockets of space in behind. And, you know, only six minutes later they get, um, they get the second. And I thought looking down at it, it was, we were the uh, enemies of our own downfall. Really. Bednarik had a long, had a high ball that he could have just, controlled and he ended up heading it straight to William and Chelsea were in and made it two. And by that and when you when it's two goals in six minutes, you're thinking, well, it's gonna take a hell of a lot to get back into this game and confidence must be really, really low. And it's just disappointing because I thought up until the first goal we were um we, we were doing all right. And then Chelsea took the um took the incentive and just um, made the game their own, really. And I think that's the difference between some of the teams that we are coming up against and us, whereas when teams give us a little bit, you have to make them kind of pay for it. And, and Chelsea were really good at that today. The, the the mistakes that we made, they capitalized on. And I think that's becoming a theme as well of, of what we what we see with, with, with the club is, you have to, you know, all those mistakes that Tamori made, if you if you turn one of those into a goal, especially early on, then that forces Chelsea to to play and come at you and that's what we want. We want them to try to, you know, come and attack and have to have to move guys forward and not just be so in control of the game um as as we're going through it that that there's no chance for us to to really apply the tactics that Ralph wants, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Chelsea certainly served us up a couple of golden opportunities. There's the one uh, lay on in the second half where Danny Ings got into the box and tried to dink it over the uh, dink it over the keeper, and it was cleared several yards off the line. And you thought those opportunities you've got to be sticking away. We've got with our pressing game is working well in terms of creating chances, but we're just not very good at the moment of taking them. And I think it's a case of once Shea Adams gets his first goal, then we should be all right. And when the likes of Gineppo comes back into the side, he's someone I think who can really turn the season around in terms of that creative spark, that match winner. We've seen it twice with the two goals that he's got out of nothing, really. Two fantastic fantastic strikes. And uh, while he's out, we don't have that that kind of spark. I think, but a lot of... um, a, a positive from today's game is the continued good form of Danny Ings. He took his goal really well, and Valerie did very well to create um, create the opportunity for him, having taken it around about four players and then pulling pulling it back. It was a really good poacher's finish from Danny Ings, and it's great to see him that he's got five goals already this season. And um, but unfortunately, I think that was the best contribution that Valerie made because for the third goal, 
he was horrendously out of position. And um, while Saint, so after after Saints got uh, that that goal for about ten minutes, it looked as though they were going to maybe force themselves back into a game that they probably didn't deserve to be back in because Chelsea had a couple of chances to make it three. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, five minutes before half time, Kante is given enough time to make a cup of tea, um, let the uh, let the tea bag stand, maybe put some slippers on before actually taking a shot from the edge of the box. And uh, uh, and then it's 3-1 at halftime. There's another mountain to climb. Yeah, I mean, at halftime, I, as soon as the whistle blew, there were boos that went around the stadium, um, at least that were audible to uh, on TV. And we all know how mics and things work, so who knows if it was actually as loud as it appeared or, or sounded. But, um, you know... Uh, an air from our center back who I think we, we have kind of as a fan base, I think picked on different center backs and we've said the center backs aren't good enough. And I think we all were kind of holding up Bednarak as, as being the one who, who should be in there. And it was who, who's going to be his partner. Um, and then even today, he, he was the one who kind of let us down. You think back to, think back to Bournemouth as well. I mean, the game was essentially over, but uh, still that's an error that, that he shouldn't make. And, you know, it's, it's just disappointing again, that, that we have this situation where we, we can't seem to find any kind of stability, um, and, and leadership in the, in the back line. And it's, it's getting to the point where that, I mean, th- those errors were, it, it very easily could have just been, you know, at two, nothing in uh, under 25 minutes. And that, that's basically the game. You know, if we don't get back into it, that there it is. And th- at that point, it looked like there was no chance we were ever going to, to be able to do that. But, um, as you said, the, we we get a goal after that uh, through some wonderful individual skill from Valerie uh, from the throw-in. Um, Ings just gets enough of it, but then uh, you know Conte again, not a guy you would expect to be scoring, but not a great job of closing him down. Um, very poor from from our midfield and from our from everybody from from the whole team as a collective unit to to allow them that space. Uh, the deflection wrong foot's gun, but um, that's just not it's just not good enough from anybody there. Um, do, do you think, speaking of gun, do you think that at any point today, any of those goals should have been saved? I guess of the first three, I guess uh, the first one, the you know, he kind of takes himself out of it, coming for the ball and not getting there. Um, the second one, I think, was a, I don't know, I don't know if you blame him for that or or if that's just a well taken shot from Mount, and then and then Conte's obviously is a, a severe deflection. But anything you get have done about about Mount's goal? I think first goal, there's not much he well. It's a it's a it's a mix up in communication and he's come for it and he's not got it and you've got to gamble on those on those situations because Abraham was to wrong goal so I I can't blame him too much for the first one because whilst he has charged out if it, it, it's a situation that shouldn't really be happening and in essence should have been cleared off the line uh, before it's gone over for the second one I don't think he got he, he, he I think the whole Saints team don't cover themselves in too much glory in the second one because they just give it away really cheaply mm. and within a couple of seconds the ball's in the back of the net. You can't really do much when your defenders are passing it straight to the opposition about 20 yards out. Um, the third one, um, again, I, third one he's got no chance because it's taken a hefty deflection and if your body weight's all going one way and the ball suddenly deflects into the opposite direction then there's no way, unless you are superhuman and decide that you're, go- decide that you're going to make the, um, the greatest save ever in football then um, there's nothing you can do. The fourth goal, Batshuayi, it's near post. It's gone underneath him. I think at that point, most of the Saints players are quite disheartened. So you're not, maybe if the game was on the line at that point, he might have been a bit more pumped, a bit more energetic to get out to it. But to make it 4-1, when it was clear that Saints weren't really going to get back into the game, that he, not a lack of effort, but I think if there was something riding on it, then maybe he... He, he, t- it, in defence of Gunn, there was an opportunity in the second half where Chelsea, for Hudson Odoi for Chelsea, where he got into the penalty area and was bearing down on goal, and he made a really good one-on-one save. He did, and that he was did. The, and so give to credit to Gunn, he made that was a really, really good save. Um, but for the four, by the by the fourth one, you're coming to the end of the match. You're you've obviously not won, you're not getting a point any point from the game. So yeah. I think I, I, th- I think it's just one of those, really. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, we should say that that uh, we, you mentioned earlier, uh, Ings had the, had a chance right at the end of the half 
Uh, and I think it was Jorginho gets back and clears the ball off the line. And that could have made, you know, things a little bit more interesting. But I think the 3-1 scoreline is fair by by all, you know, if you look at kind of how we played and, and what we were able to string together, had we gone in at 3-2, that's maybe a little generous to us. Um, but at the same time, you know, obviously I, I hope that would have been the case, but it just it just wasn't to be. So um, halftime comes around, obviously 3-1. Possession slightly in their favor, uh, passing accuracy stuff in their favor. We have more corners. Um, the fouls. I, I think the only thing that I was worried about in terms of fouls was uh, Conte had made a couple of fouls and not been booked. Uh, it looked like Lon maybe got injured early on in a, in a kind of a challenge with him, so I was a little, a little concerned with that. But um, you know, I don't think you can say that uh, during the first half that. I don't know. We just looked. We just looked disheartened. We didn't look like we were there to win it, and and I'm not really sure there's any any anything we can say about it that makes it that much better. Um, no changes early on in the second half, and and there was obviously a lot to do for the team. But I mean, one of the things that I was a little bit frustrated with, and I know other fans have been frustrated with it over over recent weeks, is is the the length of time it takes it's taking uh, Hassan Noodle to make substitutions that have an impact and. We were in a situation where we were down by two goals and not pressing forward and not kind of creating opportunities when we were the ones who needed to get back in the game. Like we couldn't make it work. And I don't know if a substitution changes it, but at least it, it, that, that appears to the fans as, hey, we are, are, we are trying to have an impact here. We're try- we realize that it's not working. We're trying. And Ralph wasn't doing that. But I mean, from your perspective up in, up in the booth, like, did did it look at all like we were getting back into the game or is it kind of just what we saw on TV for me or people in the stands that, that it was, it, it, it we weren't, we weren't really in, in the game. We didn't look like we were making progress or anything else. This is something that Callum and I actually discussed about halfway through the second half, that the replacements for needed to bring on were people that uh, were actually a bit more enthusiastic about pressing because at that point saints weren't pressing that highly. And whether it was through, not through lack of effort or maybe being a, bit disheartened, bit, bit disinterested, but the we needed a substitution just to change it. I think someone to come on with a point to prove. I think Shea Adams is the key one on the bench for this game with a point to prove, with a goal to get. He just needed someone to just up the ante a little bit and just to have, to have a go at them. I thought that the timings of the substitution were a bit odd. I thought if you're trailing by two goals at that point, the it would be better for the team for it to be a bit earlier on. Uh, I don't know if Ralph thought that the way we were playing was still going to work attacking. I mean, we ended the game with a completely different uh, attacking three uh, just to try something else. Um, It's a difficult one to say because I don't know what Ralph is going on in Ralph's head of whether he thinks that particular three at the beginning was still working in the second half. I mean, by by that point, Chelsea were knocking the ball around the park for fun. I mean, as much as it was disappointing by Saints, Chelsea were very, very good today. They were very composed. They managed the game really well. And every time Saints had it in possession, they closed us down really quickly. Um, I think it was a case of today of Saints being disappointing, but at the same time coming against a very, very good team. Yeah, I mean, Chelsea have been in pretty good form domestically uh, over the past couple of, of weeks. And you think back to the opening day of the season, they lost 4 nothing at Manchester United. Uh, they they did lose to Liverpool, um, but they've been playing fine in the Champions League even. Um, they, uh, what, what did they do? They won in the Carabao Cup, obviously. Um, and so they are, I mean, they're not, they're not setting the world on fire. Um, and, and people have talked, you know, already, and, and maybe this changes a little bit with Manchester city losing today, but I mean, Liverpool seem to be kind of running away with it already. Um, but just wait until the end of the season. We'll see where they're at. Um, uh, we can only hope that somebody else will catch them. Um, but I mean, you, you look at, at how they're playing and you, and you think this is a team in transition. This is Frank Lampard's kind of big opportunity and and whatever or this is you know it's bigger than Derby County or what whatever you want to say but this is not a team that is that is fearful uh, of us they ha- they have the players uh in some veteran leadership roles that that are that can still hurt us um they have some young players that are hungry to prove to their manager and the club that they belong there because they have this whole thing of 
you know, they tend to, to loan these, these players out for years and years and years. And, and it's not always the best kind of environment for them, but now they're in a situation where they are, are, you know, at least have the opportunity to thrive. And so to see them come and play that way, uh, Tammy Abraham, you know, looked hungry today. Uh, Hudson Adoy back from injury looked hungry today. And so you look at those guys and Mason Mount as well. They, they were all there to to play and they did. And, and, and when you're not, you know, up for it and when the guys that we would consider on our, on our squad to be the ones that, that kind of set the tone and set the pace, they're not up for it. Then it becomes really clear that, that it's going to be a long day. And I think that's kind of a little bit of what happened, but um, I mean, I guess do, should, I don't even know. I don't even know where to where to go from here in terms of trying to draw something out of the game that we can we can move forward with. I mean, other than it's the international break, hopefully you forget about it and you move on and you work on some stuff. But now it's been, you know, this is already the second international break. We've played, you know, eight matches now. We've had the summer. We've had an international break. We've had an inconsistent kind of starting lineup across the back line of formations that have been different. And it doesn't seem to be the uh, obviously the initial kind of improvement when Ralph came in. Um, you're going to get that. You're going to get whether it's a new manager bounce or whatever you want to call it. Uh, when you start something initially, you know it's a lot of fun. You you seem to progress the level at, or the quickness or the I guess the pace at which you progress is is so fast compared to what happens when you hit that first plateau or that first wall, and then you have to push through that. And I think that's where we're at with the team where you know, the initial kind of improvement is, is there and, and we've adjusted to that, but the next step is going to be, you know, harder to deal with. And, and as you pointed out, the teams that we've played against Chelsea included have not been easy uh, and it doesn't get any easier, but it just means that, you know, we're, we're one win away from having the same number of points that we had in the middle of December last year. Um, but and I, it, it's hard to find out when we're going to get, or hard to imagine when we're going to actually get that, that win to, to draw us back to that, to that point, I think. I completely agree. I think it's a case of it's, it's a different job now for Ralph because he proved his point last season where he can, um, he got us, he got us actually playing to a certain style. Again, like I said earlier, it's been like you've just said, it's been a very difficult set of opening fixtures and it doesn't get any easier. I think the unfortunate thing is, is that whilst it doesn't get any easier. The more points that are not collected in these uh, in these fixtures, the more pressure Ralph will be under to collect the points, maximum points, when we when the fixtures start to become a bit more favourable. And especially the big home matches against Watford and Norwich are going to be there's going to be huge pressure on us to get three points from both of those. So he's, it's a different job now for Ralph. He's got to get he's got to um, get that pressing identity um, back and more prevalent in the side. I think a positive for for, uh, for for the moment is that when we come back from the international break, we hope that Gineppo is going to be fit and able to play. We hope that Cedric will be back because he's been fantastic since coming back into the side, and I think he's very much been deserving of that starting right back position over Valerie and. I think, in a, in a way, norm, normally the international breaks are something that I think, oh, it's two, it's two weeks without Saints. But now, for this moment in time, I'm thinking it could actually do us good. Just a break, just to take stock of what's going on, just to get the injured players back. And then thinking, right, let's start again, because I, I might be wrong, but I think this is the last international break until March. Um, so... In a way, that's going to be four, four, five, six months of uninterrupted games. This is where the real stuff is starting to happen. This is when fixture management, squad management is going to come into play as we go into the winter period of matches in December, when I think we have about seven games in a month. It's There's a lot of pressure on Ralph to get points in those matches, and... I think that the international break has actually come at a decent time this time around. Yeah, because you never want to have it when it's killing your your momentum, right? But our momentum is downwards at this point, so uh, maybe we'll take it. Um, we do have one more um, in November. We play. We come back, we'll play another four league games and have another break. Uh, and then we go on that long run where we go through the busy season and we, do, and we go all the way until March. So there's one more chance to make some some assessments or some some changes, but but really... Uh, the the run of matches that we have is as you mentioned uh, not not great not 
uh, other than we, we do get to play Everton, um, which Marco Silva is having uh, an interesting t- time, I think, to say the least. But anyway, uh, that that is that. Um, I did just want to go back to to what we were talking about earlier in terms of the the lack of kind of commitment from Saints in the second half. Uh, I think Maya Shida had the first shot on target in the second half. And reminder, we were down 3-1 uh, going into it. Um, and that came in the 74th minute from, you know, just like halfway between the halfway line and the edge of the 18 yard area. Um, that, I mean, if that's the first shot we're going to have on target in, in the second half, that that's not good enough from a team who needs to get back into it. And so I think that was a lot of my frustration as I was watching the match is just, you know, looking at the team and going like, you know, we need, we need to do something, but we've, I think we've talked about that kind of, kind of enough. Um, so we have, we have a couple of questions um, from listeners. Are you okay with, with moving that direction? And, or, or yeah, yeah. It? I think, I think it's good just to, as Nigel Adkins famously said, draw a blue line under the last match and move on. That's good. Cause I, I feel like we're, we could sit here and, and just continue to kind of to beat, to beat a dead horse, but I, I, it's not probably good for anybody to just stew on it for that long. Um, and you know, and it's, it's a football game, right? Like there's a lot of other stuff that goes on in life that is, that is better than this. Um, but it's for so many people, this is their relaxation and their entertainment. And when it doesn't go well, it's hard, it's hard to feel like things are, are, are great, you know? Um, but anyway, um, I guess one question on the, one more question on the substitutions. Were you upset that, that Armstrong didn't come in? Um, at all where you, I was a little shocked by the Obafemi for a long substitution um, given that, you know, we needed to create a couple of opportunities, but for you, was that, was that a problem? Uh, I thought actually the Obafemi coming on was actually quite a good move because mm-hmm. against Portsmouth, I was a bit skeptical about him coming, uh, coming into the side, especially making a first start leading the line in the South coast derby. I thought, that's quite a bold move to make, but he actually flourished in the environment and he set up in second goal with a fantastic pass. So he definitely has that um, ability to create. He has pace on his side and I think he's very, as a young player, he's very enthusiastic. Not to say that none of our other players are enthusiastic, but I think that he was a good player to to bring on at the time because he could just bring a bit of hunger and drive to the front line. Whether Armstrong should have come on in place of maybe one of the second substitutes. I don't know because the other two players were Che Adams, who needs a goal, and their final substitution was Sofiane Buffal, who is arguably our most talented uh, talented technical player and the, has the ability to create something out of nothing. So if you're looking for creativity, I think Sofiane Buffal is going to bring a bit more than Armstrong. I think Armstrong is a very good player to bring on to see out the game, someone that can just make the... The, the easy decision, not having to be too difficult on the ball and just to calm things down. Whereas if you need someone to create a bit of magic out of nowhere, then Sofiane Buffal is the much better option to go with. Okay. All right. It's, I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm okay with, with it in the end. It was just a little bit shocking. Uh, at the time I would have thought that, uh, Armstrong would have been in line to, to come in, but, um, you know, it it didn't work either way and that's that's just you live and learn and, and you move on so um we do have some questions we have some from uh the private discord chat which the patrons of the show have access to and you are one of them as well so thank you for that tom i appreciate that um and, and that's one of the benefits including you know you, you get priority for having your questions answered you get access to the private chat uh and sometimes you get extra podcast episodes and all of the five dollar a month patrons uh, get an extra podcast episode per, uh, per, per month. So, um, we do have some questions from the group chat and we have some from Twitter as well. We have one from Rob here that says, uh, do you think that our position in the table and the points total is more reflective of the teams we faced or the strength or lack thereof of our squad? Or in other words, if we had an easier run of games, would we be considerably higher in the table or are we just bad? Um, and you know, we've mentioned and talked about the strength of the, the teams we we faced, but, even I would say that when we come up, when we've come up against teams that have been, you know, that we would have thought we would have beaten, it hasn't always been comfortable. And you look at around, and teams are are seemingly able to knock off some of the bigger teams. You look at at what Wolves did today to to Manchester City. Uh, you you look at what Norwich had done or Norwich had done. I'm gonna get in trouble for saying the, the W there. Um, you look at what they've been able to do earlier in the season and. 
it's, you know, we need to win some of these games. Otherwise it, you wind up just relying on beating the teams that you should be beating. And we all know that doesn't always happen. I think it's a case of, of both. Um, in answer to the question, I think that we would be higher in the, t- in the table had our fixtures been a bit more favorable. I think whilst you can say Wolves have beaten Manchester City, it's a fantastic result. Norwich have beaten Manchester City. They have played these teams in amongst fixtures that for them they were deemed as quite winnable and actually haven't won those ones. Whereas for Saints, it's been a case of playing the big boys one after the other. And I think that can really hit your confidence when you think that you're playing quite well, but you're not getting the results because the other teams are just simply a bit better than you. And I think that had we had maybe a more of a balanced set of fixtures in terms of, I know we say, yeah, but we've played Bournemouth at home, we've played Brighton, we've played Sheffield United. We've got the wins against Brighton, against Sheffield United. The Bournemouth game was a disappointment, but I think maybe some players and certainly the fans had one eye on the Pompey game uh, just a matter of days later. That doesn't excuse the, um, the manner of the performance, but I think... I think that, yeah, whilst these other teams can beat the big boys every now and then, uh, they've had those in amongst fixtures that they were deemed winnable. And for Saints, it's just been a case of having these big teams and difficult matches in a row. And yes, I think, I think that we are better than what the, where we are currently in the table, but it doesn't help that we're playing some matches where we're playing quite well, but not actually getting the result purely because we're playing against one of those sides that will be fighting for either the title or European football. Right. Right. And I I can, I can totally see that where it's, it's just, it seems like it's one after another of just haymaker after haymaker hitting you. And it's, it's not, it's not at all what you want. You just want a little, a little respite from, from all of it. And it's just not happening for us. Um, And then there's, and then when, when you get in that situation, then you place kind of added pressure on yourself to make sure that you get a win against the teams that you should. Um, and then, you know, that, that pressure t- tends to sometimes backfire. So I think we're, we're making it harder on ourselves than it has to be. Um, we're also not, we haven't had the rub of the green necessarily. Um, and we all knew this. We all knew this looking at what the team was, uh, what, what the schedule looked like as soon as it came out. That was one of the things that I think a lot of us looked at and, and pointed out was this, this run of fixtures early on is going to be rough. And you just have to hope that we're in a situation or in a mental kind of state to to take advantage when, when we have, when we get, we get the opportunity to go on a run of games, maybe that, that we can win uh, or should win, I guess. Um, Kevin McGee, who's another one of the patrons says after three league defeats in a row and potentially uh, it could get worse before it gets better. How do we all stay positive and strong through this period? Um, I'm going to go ahead and kind of default to you on this. I, I try really hard to stay positive. Um, it is, it is work for me. I think I, I'm not, sure if people only know me from the, the this show they will i think probably think that i am a, a pretty positive and i try to be but that's a that's a new thing in the last five years or so of, of trying to be uh, going out of my way to try to be positive and it is testing at times especially um i, I think it's even harder this season uh, right now just in this moment because the game was only a couple of hours ago uh and and we you know we have a coach that i believe in and i know who can do the job whereas before I was, I wanted to believe that they, they could do it, but now I have the coach. I think that I would, that I would want. And still, uh, you know, the, when the results don't happen, it becomes a little bit more difficult to, to just be, you know, be that positive kind of person that about and feel that way about the team. But I mean, what about you? How do you, how do you try to deal with this stuff like this? I think an easy way to feel positive at the moment is if you go on YouTube and if you search Portsmouth nil Southampton four, you'll find a really good video that will lift your spirits. And if you constantly play that on repeat at full volume, um, that should make you smile. And just remember that at the end of the day, we're only eight games into the season. There are 30 left to go. Teams at the top of the table will, some teams at in the top half are not going to be there in uh, come the end of the season. And some teams in the, in the bottom half are not going to be in, in there. Some of them will go up, some of them will go down. The teams in the, rele- in the relegation zone are unlikely to be the same ones that are going to be there come the end of the season, or they might be. But, you know, we're, it's still very, very early in the season. We do get to play everyone twice. We are going to have a run of fixtures against teams that um, we are going to be really hoping that we can win. And I wouldn't start to worry unless we actually come up to those fixtures and don't pick up maximum points. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right. So we have a couple of other questions from Twitter. Um, one comes from Kipanini, I think. Uh, it could be pronouncing that wrong. Um, and he says, where's the guile and the creativity in the team? And I think that was definitely something that's lacking today. You look back to Spurs last weekend, the creativity aspect wasn't there. Um, do you, do we just not have the players for it? Cause you would have thought that with the guys like Sofian Buffal kind of in the team and the way Redmond was kind of working last season, that, that there would be some sort of creativity, but it seems like the goals are coming from individual moments of brilliance or, you know, Danny Ings charging down goalkeepers. Um, but in terms of our team creating full blown kind of chances and cutting through teams, it doesn't seem to be there. I think that's a, I think that's kind of the same along the same lines of what we've, what we've seen over the past couple of seasons. But uh, for you, is that, is that, is, are we just missing the players? Is it the system or, or what do you, what do you think is, is uh, going on there? I think that opinion might change a little bit. had Che Adams put away some of the chances he's had in the first few games, because um, I mean, he, obviously his confidence isn't, isn't isn't there at the moment but in the early on in the first few fixtures he's had quite a few chances he could have almost scored within about a minute and a half of his debut against Burnley so that was that's one key chance that we've made he then missed a header against Liverpool earlier on in the game he's had and again there was another one against Manchester United which he somehow uh, sent almost towards the roof of the stadium but he I don't want to put any I don't want to put blame on everybody because everyone uh, oh, oh, sorry, I don't want to put blame on one player because everybody is guilty of missing really good opportunities. Um, certainly today with Danny Ings, he should have put his one away, uh, his second one away, I mean. But um, I think it's a case of we we can create, it's just the final product is not finding the back of the net. And a lot of, also a lot of those good chances have been created from Musa Gineppo. And again, you don't want to put a lot of pressure on one man, but um, we certainly seem to be lacking a bit of a spark when he's not in the team. And I know he's only been here for a, and able to play for about four or five matches. But it's clear to see in those four or five games, he's been able to create quite a bit. And um, if it weren't for him, then we might actually be in the relegation zone at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm looking for the, the stats on, on chances created uh, for the club. It's, I think last week we saw that Spurs, we almost made it might have been better off playing against 10 men uh, or having them be level or behind and forcing them to kind of come at us. But as soon as we went behind and they could just sit um, deep and be organized and Sissoko do the job that he did against Bertrand and uh, working down our left, um, it was, it was pretty impressive uh, for them, but it was also frustrating for us because we had so much of the ball. We couldn't find uh, the chances in it. And I think if you look at most of our chances aren't coming um, by via those kinds of, of opportunities they are coming from winning the ball high up the field and, and getting shots away and kind of creating confusion, but not necessarily just, you know, being able to create chances when teams are sitting back and, and doing that, looking for our stats on big chances missed. Uh, we have 13. We're fifth in the league uh, in terms of that rank as of now. Um, so, I mean, you're talking 13 opportunities where you would have assumed teams would have you know, scored. And, and if you look at the teams who are at the top of that list, the top three, Liverpool, Manchester City, and Chelsea, they just create that number of opportunities. They are going to miss those, but they are confident that they are going to make and, and, and convert those uh, time and time again. Um, above us and fourth in that, in that stat is, is Everton. They're tied with us. Uh, they're also towards the bottom of the table and not doing well. And I think that you can see the, the confidence there for both of those teams is we create the chance, we miss the chance, and then it's, it's over. Um, but I would have to do much more research in terms of how exactly those chances are coming about, uh, where they've been taken, um, you know, kind of who's missed them and what it's meant, you know, later on. And, and I just don't, I haven't done the, the kind of necessary research on that, uh, as of now, but I think sometimes I get too caught up in what's happened the last week or the last week and a half. Whereas if you really kind of step back and look like we've created chances, they're just not when teams sit deep and, and, and say, Hey, break us down. Good luck. Um, that's not where we're strong, and that's just kind of, I think, where where we're at. But um, I don't know if you want to add anything, or if we just want to kind of move on to to the to the next question, which I think it will bring us towards the end. I think if we move on to the uh, the next question, I think we've said what we really can about that. It's just a case of um, the statistics would be a bit better if we'd actually taken those chances, and sure. uh, until until we do, it's just going to be the same the same old story. Okay. Um, so two parts of this question from James Willis, uh, who's at James Willis 86 on Twitter, uh, says, 
can Ings and Adams play together? Uh, so that's part two. So I guess I will start with start there. Um, yeah, I think they can. I think I think they are both versatile enough to be able to to work off one another. But I'm not sure. It depends on the formation. And I think maybe we have better wide players than Adams. Um, I'm not sure he's he's going to be best suited to play out wide. Uh, you think of Redmond being there. You think of Buffal being there. I think that offers a little bit more than Adams does out out wide. But that said, um, you know, through the middle, Ings seems to be the guy that's in form and doing the job, and maybe you leave him in. Um, but I think if you put him up top into two, sure, I think it could work. I think they are both fully capable, and, and Adams will come along. He's young. Um, he's He took a long time to get going last year in the championship, and then he managed to kind of turn it around. So I'm not necessarily all that concerned about, about how he's going. But uh, what are your thoughts on the two of them uh, as a strike partnership? I think they can work really well. Um, I mean, Che Adams with a bit more confidence and having found the back of the net uh, is a completely different prospect um, than, than now. But even now, um, a key example would be against, uh, again, against Portsmouth. Yes, I know their lower league opposition, but he created a lot of really good chances for Danny Ings. There was one where he managed to play him in with one of the best outside of the foot um, through balls I think I've seen in a long time, especially uh, the way he managed to chip it over the Portsmouth defender from about, I think it was like a 30-yard pass, and we're completely facing the wrong direction with the outside of his foot. He's managed to play Danny Ings in with just one glance at him. Che Adams creates a lot, and that's something I think he adds to the side um, aside from his goals. Um, when he does eventually get his first Premier League goal, I think he'll be a very, very good strike partner for Danny Ings. But you've got to play Ings at the moment because he is the striker in form. He's the one that's got five goals so far this season. And I think they can play well together. Um, it's just a case of the stats don't really um, back that up at the moment. But that's purely because either of them are missing a few chances. But they're creating uh, when they play together. And I think that's um, that's enough for me at the moment. I think we have a long ways to go in terms of the season and they will have opportunities to play both together and separately. Um, and it's, I mean, that's what we're relying on with Ralph in terms of finding the opportunities for them to, to really do the job. And so I only hope that we can, we can manage to, uh, to, to do that. But um, the last part of James's question, uh, or the first part actually, uh, says, would we miss Ross Wilson? And Ross Wilson obviously been linked um, with, he's, he's director of football operations and a board member at the club. Uh, he's been linked with a move to Rangers, um, which I know will anger uh, several of the listeners to the show uh, who have ties to Celtic, and that's fine. Um, so sorry we're mentioning the R word here. Um, but anyway, there's there's this kind of idea if he moves like would we miss him and that's what james is asking and and so i'm kind of just you know looking back he's been at the club since march 2015 um and just kind of going back and looking at uh, things that he's been been in charge of we'll just go over it real quickly uh, scouting and recruitment of, of senior at the senior level and the academy football operations football administration um performance analysis contract negotiations and management um those are all the things that he's kind of been involved in um he's worked at, at huddersfield town before this uh, Watford, uh, in addition to a couple of other places. But uh, if you kind of go back and just look at our transfers, uh, the players that arrived um, in the kind of March of, of 15 onward, um, it's it's quite a lot. He's been around for a lot of things. He's seen people uh, like Luke Shaw and Adam Milan and Dejan Lovren all leave the club. Um, he's seen guys like uh, Sadio Mane, Shane Long, Dusan Tadic, Ryan Bertrand, Fraser Forrester, Graziano Pella, Florin Gardos all show up. Um, as well as Ryan Bertrand and things like that. Like you look at the number of players that have come in under him, um, you know, going forward a couple of years, Van Dyke, Classy, Romeo, not all of them have been wonderful. Uh, not all of them have been um, kind of locked in, but we've had a, a difficult kind of past couple of, of, of transfer windows, surely. But um, from your perspective, do you think that we would, we would miss uh, a guy like that, and and my with my thing, my thinking would be to to lose another senior level kind of executive. That's that's more kind of destabilization at the top. You want your operations to kind of run smoothly. We've had turnover in manager management over the past couple of seasons. 
had high turnover in players in terms of going out alone and not being able to kind of sell them on. And, and obviously with less read gone, uh, that's created a kind of change and a shift in, in how the things are set up at the executive level. Um, so, I mean, would this be a big loss for us? Do you, do you think, and we can only speculate obviously. And if we lose him, do you think this is something that we will, uh, maybe look back on and, and regret potentially? I think that it's quite keen not to lose him because you don't want to have any more reshuffles of backroom staff because we've already had quite a bit of that in the past uh, half a year or so. That's been constantly happening, especially through last season where things have changed. People have got been in different positions. Yeah, he's not. His transfer record hasn't been glorious. Some there's been a couple of decent players that he's brought in, the likes of um, Van Dijk. And I'd even consider, you know, Gabby Adini if he can, if only he'd continued the form that he started off at. Um, but again, there's in and around those good players, you've got players that haven't worked out. You've got the likes of Wesley Hoop, you've got the likes of Mario Lamina, um, but uh, and of course one of the best examples, Guido Carrillo, who has done nothing. Um, but that is, there's only so much you can pin that on the person doing the transfers because if they do all the scouting and they deem them to actually work in a system and they've seen all that they can see to give them an answer that says, you know what, he's going to work out here, it's then up to the player to actually do that. And certainly with the likes of Mario Lamina, who doesn't really have the application um, to, to really match the talent that he thinks he has, um, you can only you can only do so much. But you, you know what I mean. You can only yeah. do so. You can only do so much to think. Okay, that player is going to work out here. And a, a more recent one, um, Elianusi. I was excited when he joined. I thought he was a very skillful player, and I thought that he could bring quite a lot to the attack. Unfortunately, um, he's come into the Premier League and ended up being a bit like a rabbit in the headlights. And that does happen. But as a person recruiting these players, you can only do so much to, and say to the manager, this guy's going to fit your system. Um, it's then up to the player to actually live up that, to that and prove that, um, provide that application to the role. And Elianusi um, obviously got a bit, uh, a bit of stage fright and became, just sort of um, uh, went almost back into a bit of a cocoon and didn't in, express himself. And I think that actually he might be able to show more of what he can do up in the Scottish League where he's given a bit more freedom and a bit more time to actually express himself. And maybe if he can get some confidence back and prove to himself that he is the player that he was when he uh, to get the move to the Premier League, then he could almost be like a Buffal and come back a, a different player. So I think in, in essence, in terms of people saying he has a poor, Ross, Wilson, Ross Wilson has a poor transfer record, uh, some of the players, yes, he's brought in a question of all, but again, I go to the back to the point that there's only so much you can do if you think a player fits the spot. That's that's up to you. I think that it would be bad if we do lose him because he's a he's a he's a nice enough person. I actually saw him today before I went in, and he said hello to all of us. So no, nice people doesn't mean that you're you're good at your role. Um, <laughs> No, no, but uh, uh, just being nice doesn't mean that you're you're, you're good at your role. But he, um, we don't need any more upheaval. We've already lost Danny Roll to um, Bayern Munich, and I think that has had an effect on Ralph. I think yeah. the uh, the less of a shake up uh, that it just we need some stability and and uh, just things going on as normal and with him if he was to go then that only just creates a bit more confusion in the back room sure absolutely absolutely well uh i think i think we should leave it there unless there's anything else that you want to add um and tom i'm sorry this wasn't like a you know necessarily the greatest of uh of things to come out and talk about it seems that i i'm trying not to be super downbeat about everything and it's it is only eight games in there's still 30 games left it's still a long season there's still plenty of opportunities to um turn this around, but, uh, it's, it's, it's a, it was a disappointing, uh, match today to say the least. And, and I think a lot of things, what people will say is the lack of fight, uh, from the team just didn't, it didn't look convincing. We hadn't seen that in some time. We've been, we've been, uh, lucky enough to see the team come out and give at least maximum effort. Um, or at least it would appears to be maximum effort. And today it just didn't seem to be there, but 
Um, whether that it's hard for us to say whether or not the guys were working as hard as they could today or, or whatever it was. So, um, you know, difficult to, to do that, but, um, I just want to say thank you again. Uh, it's always, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, we don't, we don't get to do it as often, I'm sure as we, as we would like, but it is, it is kind of a, what it is, but, um, yeah, if people want to follow you or get in touch with you on Twitter, especially for, um, in terms of, of knowing when the audio description commentary is available at what away grounds, it's always available for all home matches, but, uh, for, for away grounds and things like that. So they can follow you on Twitter at T two one four Murray. Uh, they can follow the under the lights podcast at, uh, at under, and then an underscore and then saints links to those are there. Uh, we will put the, uh, link to the saints, Twitter account, the saints AD Twitter account in there as well. So, um, when you tweet out those details about wolves coming up, uh, people will be able to, uh, to get in touch there and, and be able to find the devices that they need in order to make that happen. So, uh, if I missed, if I've done anything wrong there, said anything wrong, correct me. Um, and yeah, just thanks a lot for, for coming on. Thank you very much for having me on again. No, no, uh, no mistakes there. Everything is, uh, the links are all, all correct. And as, uh, again, I will put out a tweet shortly about, um, any Saints fans going up to Wolves that didn't know that they had the audio description service. And, uh, hopefully we can get some users up there. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It'd be really, really good. And, um, hopefully we'll talk again soon, whether it's, uh, online via chat or, uh, in the Patreon discord chat or wherever it happens uh, hopefully uh we'll do that and if not we'll we'll catch up on here again soon absolutely thank you very much for having me that does it for this episode of the southampton delivery podcast thank you so much for joining us i hope you've enjoyed it special thanks this week goes out to tom murray you can find him on twitter at t214 murray you can get his podcast the under the lights podcast at under underscore saints if you're interested in any of the services provided by alan march sport uh, you can get them on twitter at alan march sport the info for the saints audio description commentary is at saints underscore ad Uh, give them a follow uh, check in uh, spread the word about the service if you know anybody who can use it Um, that is really like kind of why we're here help everybody enjoy saints even though there wasn't maybe that much to enjoy uh, on sunday While you're following Tom on Twitter and everywhere else, you can follow this show. We are at SFC D E L L underscore I V E R Y on both Twitter and Instagram. And we're on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash SFC delivery. There's no underscore in the Facebook address. Maybe this is your first time listening to the show. And in that case, you may want to subscribe. If you've enjoyed it, uh, you can do that by going to Southampton delivery.com. There are links to a number of audio platforms, or you can search Southampton delivery uh, in whatever podcast app you choose. Just make sure it doesn't autocorrect to just one L, even though that's what Chelsea gave us on Sunday. If you've been here before and you're enjoying the show, please consider leaving a review on iTunes. It helps spread the word to new potential listeners. Uh, That means a lot to me, but thanks just so much for listening. I'd also like to say thank you to the patrons of the show. Uh, who follow along over at patreon.com forward slash SFC delivery. Uh, your small monetary contribution each month helps to make sure the show continues to run uh, from the website to the hosting uh, to the batteries for the recorder. Uh, that's all down to you guys. And uh, you should be on the lookout for something in the mail uh, over the next couple of weeks. Um, they have all been sent out as long as I have your address. So if you're one of the ones who hasn't responded to that, uh, get in touch and uh, I'll get you your stuff. Enjoy. If you're interested in becoming a patron, you can head on over to patreon.com forward slash SFC delivery. Uh, check out the tiers, uh, see what you get, see if that's something that interests you. But uh, really, you just listening to the show is more than enough for me. So thank you for that. In addition to those guys over at patreon.com forward slash SFC delivery, the partners of the show make the show go as well. Uh, our logo is designed by Matt Beeling, who sometimes can be found at We Are Southampton on Instagram. The Southampton page is our partner page. And for all of your Southampton FC news and needs, be sure to follow them on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. They'll keep you up to date with everything from uh, midweek press conferences to in-game coverage. Uh, That is where you need to go if you're looking to stay up to date with everything going on at the club. And although we are heading into the international break, we will be back with another episode next week. So be sure to be on the lookout for that. Be sure you're subscribed on iTunes, Stitcher, Acast, Google Play, TuneIn Radio, or wherever you listen to podcasts to make sure you don't miss it. Newsletter out on Friday. Until then, remember that together, we march on.